Allow me to present our first speaker, Aziz Looks, the chief storyteller with Storytelling for Business. Give him a big, fat round of applause. Is this working? And this is the largest group I talk to outside of an AA meeting. So it's very intimidating. Now, um, what is storytelling? This is a question I get a lot, especially that I put my job title as a chief storyteller. So people think I'm joking, but then they know I'm dead serious about it. Storytelling is a communication method. It's very old. The first stories or the first evidence of visual stories we find in France if, there, if you have any French here, let them pronounce the name of these caves. You know them? There you go. It's very easy. Um, dates as back as 15,200 BC, people uh, documented stories. And they did it for a reason. These stories were meant to convey information. And they were meant to do it in an emotional way to create a relevance. Yeah? But business storytelling. Is it a different thing? As a matter of fact, it's not different at all. 17,000 years uh, after, we still do the same thing. We try to convey information with emotional relevance so we can create a connection with the audience. The only difference is we have more tools, slightly more tools, but the basic idea is the same. So how could something last and continue to grow for 17,000 years? The reason is very simple. Storytelling works because we're hardwired as humans to engage and react more to stories than we do to facts. If you want to create a relevance with your audience, if you want them to understand you, if you want them to remember you, you tell them a story. You don't recite the facts. There's a lot of research about that, and I encourage you to go and find, uh, check it out. A lot of psychology research that's been done and it all shows the same results. Um, I come from Damascus, a city that has a notorious tradition of storytelling. And this is a coffee shop in the old city. It's about 10 minutes from my high school. I used to escape a lot and go there to watch this storyteller. The same guy, actually. I'm not sure he's still around, but at the time when he was, it was an amazing experience. And he has five elements to complete the storytelling process. And these five, five elements are what I do every day in my business today. The five elements to storytelling are the plot, which is in the book he holds, the characters, so some of which you'll find on the walls here, the audience, obviously, mostly smoking shisha, yeah. It's key to storytelling, by the way. Um, the stage. And the most important element of a storytelling process is the moral of the story. You never tell a story for the fun of it. You're always conveying some sort of an information and you want an outcome. There is a purpose to storytelling. So today, we're gonna go quickly in about 20 minutes or 15 minutes and then five minutes of questions over the five elements and try to understand how each of them or how all of them come together to shape the storytelling process. First is the plot. The plot is the framework of your story, and it works on the principle of cause and effect. So a plot of a story is usually very, very simple, and it's very basic. Um, for example, the Trojans um, stole Helen from the Greeks. Yeah? So the Greeks besieged Troy for, what, 10 years? But the Trojans were very strong. They defended the city for 10 years. So the Greeks used the horse to conquer the city. That is the plot, as simple as that. Anything else that fills between those four elements or four points of the story is not the plot. That's events carried by characters. Um, another example of a plot. I wanted to do storytelling for business, but the traditional communication agency structure does not support this, so I quit and started my own. Very regret, but it happened. So that's a plot. Now, 
to carry on the plot, to execute your plot, you need characters. And this is the second element of the story. And when we talk about characters, it's very important to talk about this gentleman here. This is Carl Jung. He is the founder of the uh, modern psychoanalysis. And why he is important to storytelling and to characters is because Carl Jung said, all humans interact with the world, perceive and interact with the world in 12 different ways. And he calls them the archetypes. Now, those of you in branding are probably very, very familiar with the archetype concept because we usually you know, build brands or, or give brands archetypes for the simple reason that this brand will need this archetype to interact with the world. And that is the same reason why archetypes are important when you take, talk about characters, is because the characters will be your representative, your representative when you interact with the, with the world as a brand. So, uh, he wasn't the first, by the way, to talk about archetypes. His um, ideas or his thoughts of the archetypes are based on Plato's uh, ideas of the forms. So they're very solid, actually. You can take his word for it. We will go through the 12 archetypes that Carl Jung um, established. And we will see examples of brands that represent this, these archetypes. The first one is the innocent. Um, I'm going to have to read a little bit from a paper, if that's OK. The innocent motto is free to be you and me. That's very innocent, I guess. And they have a core desire is to get to paradise. When I think of a brand like this, an innocent brand, this is what I think of. Dove is a brand that competes in the cosmetics and beauty industry, usually an industry that plays on sexiness and uh, unique, but mostly preconceived idea of beauty. Dove came and said, Beauty comes in all shapes and forms. You are beautiful the way you are, and that's it. Doesn't get more innocent than this, and it doesn't get more free to be yourself than this. So that's a good example of a free uh, or of an innocent brand. The second archetype, or the second character that can be a representative of a brand is the orphan or the regular guy. Their motto is all men and women are created equal. And their core desire is to connect with others. A brand that represents this archetype, in my opinion, is IKEA. Again, what did IKEA do? They said, everybody deserves a good design. Everybody deserves a lifestyle. It doesn't have to cost you a fortune. We will make it available. And we will connect with everyone. And we will belong in everybody's house. So they freed. And they made the um, furniture or design furniture accessible. Third archetype is the hero. Now, the hero goes by the motto, where there's will, there's a way. And their core desire is to prove one's worth through courageous actions. Can anybody think of a brand that represents the hero archetype? A brand that did, does always something courageous. A brand that encourages people to do courageous actions. Who said Nike? Yeah, we agree. Just because Nike is better at it. <laughs> Just do it. So what, what Nike did is they came and said, look, you don't have to be Carl Johnson or whoever. You don't have to be gifted. All you need to do is have determination, put some work into it, and buy some decent running shoes, and you can run a marathon in six months. And they convinced a lot of people that they can do this. And a lot of people did it. I'm not one of them. I think Nabil is. Nabil is a runner, right? Yeah. Now the caregiver, that's the fourth. Um, their motto is, love your neighbor as yourself. And their core desire is to protect and care. When I think of a caring brand, besides Dubai, possibly, I think of Volvo. You see, where they, where they stand 
out of the crowd is really back in the, I think, uh, 60s. They were just another automotive company. They were making cars. Everyone was happy. No one asked them to do anything more than cars. But they just looked at the numbers, and people were dying in car accidents, a lot of people. So Volvo said, you know, that's not right, really. Let's do something about it. And they invented the uh, seat belt. As simple as that. They just did it out of care. There was no regulations, no uh, requirement from automotive industry to have seat belt. They invented the thing, and then it became standard. So that's a very caring brand. Now the Explorer. That is a brand that goes, or a character that goes by the motto, don't fence me in. And their core desire is the freedom to find out who they are through exploring the world. The ultimate explorer brand, or archetype in my opinion, is... We'll come to Red Bull. They're not, the Red Bull is not necessarily the explorer. National Geography is a good example, yeah. But because I own a Jeep, I went with that. Uh, not really because I own it, but because they also made the car that uh, drove on the moon. They made the lunar rover. So, I mean, when it comes to really exploring and pushing boundaries, that's it. Then um, another brand, or another archetype, is the Rebel. The Rebel goes by the motto, rules are made to be broken. And their core desire is to revenge or revolt. Now, this is one of the most misunderstood um, archetypes. It usually goes with a lot of bad, uh, bad perception, simply because people don't like to change the status quo. Most of us, if we find a comfortable situation, we stay in it. The rebels don't. They always change the status quo. The ultimate, again, rebel brand, in my opinion, nah, no. Nah. No. These guys. Yeah, well, they, they, they actually did two revolutions. The first, when they started, because they changed the engineering behind the motorcycle, they did their engine in a way that wasn't done before. But the second and the most important way they revolve and they changed the status quo again is when they were misunderstood. So they made those wonderful motorcycles. Unfortunately, they get associated, associated with gangs and drugs and hell's angels and all of that. So, you know, people start thinking, th the minute you hear uh, uh, the, the sound of a uh, Harley Davidson, trouble is knocking. That's not true. And they knew it's not true. So they went on a massive branding exercise, massive storytelling exercise, and they showed the world that basically, Harley Davidson as a brand gives you the opportunity to rebel but you don't necessarily have to be a bad, you know, bad person. Just a regular banker who takes three hours of his busy week to ride a bike and bike and be, a, you know, a cool guy for some time. The lover. Now, this is an interesting archetype. Their motto is that you're the only one. And their core desire is intimacy and experience. Any suggestions? One more. <laughs> Johnson could be more of a care caregiver, yeah? But Chanel actually is that brand. You know, in the fashion world, this is a brand that sustained a lot and remained very close to its clients and remained very personal and intimate. It's not trendy. It's not necessarily the most in. Hala, anything to say about this? Agree, disagree? I don't know much about Chanel, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it. The creator, the archetype with which most of you in the room will probably associate. Um, they go by the motto, if you can imagine it, it can be done. It's very simple. As long as you can imagine something, doing it is easy. And their core desire is to create things of enduring value. Who said Apple before? Yeah, that's Apple. Yes, but uh, th this, is, this is very important. You, you are never one archetype. 
not as a human, not as a brand. You're, you're a mix of many, but there's always a prominent. So like a primary and a secondary. So basically, um, Apple could be the uh, creator and the rebel at the same time. Yeah. But these guys are, in, in my opinion, as a brand, they're the ultimate creator. They created things we didn't know that we need. And now we can't live without. That's very, very uh, big. The exact opposite of a creator is the ruler. As an archetype, they go by a motto, power isn't everything, it's the only thing. And their core desire is to control. Any suggestions? Exactly. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah. Unlike Apple, they didn't try to create anything new after Microsoft, after the Windows, sorry. They just wanted to control the market. They did everything they can to make sure that you use your, their, your, their product and you stay, you stay their client. Didn't work very well for them, I guess. Now, come to the magician. This is one of the rarest archetypes you will ever meet. They don't come across a lot of uh, magicians. Their motto is, I make things happen. They don't create, they don't change, just make things happen, you know, like magic. And the core desire is understanding the fundamentals of the universe. So basically, you understand the universe and you make magic. Anybody knows a brand that makes magic? Who said Disney? Yeah, Disney. Also NASA, by the way. NASA is, a, is another magician brand. Nobody understands the universe more than they do, and nobody has done things that never been done before like they did. But Disney, I think we all resonate with that at some point of our life. The gesture is all about happiness. Uh, their motto is, you only live once. And their core desire is to live in the moment with full enjoyment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're, wearing, you're wearing the shirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. This is the, to me, this is the ultimate example of storytelling. A brand that produces a product that nobody needs, probably bad for all of us, yet we can't, smile, we can't help but smiling when we come across the brand. They don't sell you a product. They sell you happiness, and you buy it time after time after time. Whether you drink the product, the, the, whether you consume the product or not, it's a, it's a secondary thing. But they've managed to confront a major reputational crisis with storytelling, not with press releases. And last but not least, the sage. That's an archetype that believes the truth will set you free, and their core desire is to find the truth. My favorite archetype, and an example of that is Wikipedia. Yeah, uh, We said, why not Google? But I find Google a little bit more too commercial to be the ultimate example of the sage. But these guys aren't. They're all about the truth. So that's it. 12 archetypes that you need to basically sit and think, what am I as a brand? Where do I fit in those 12 archetypes? And basically, that will dictate the way your characters will interact and represent you to the world. So now we know what the plot is, we know who the characters are. The question becomes, who is the audience? We need an audience, right? We need to talk to someone. So you have to answer three main questions when you think of storytelling as a process. Who are they? Who is my audience? And whatever you do, don't fall for the trap of everyone. Many of you received a brief and in the target audience, it was all of Qatar. Now, that's never, never going to happen. Never going to succeed, will not get you anywhere. Don't accept it unless you're paid to. But if you're doing something, don't assume you're talking to everyone because you will not reach any good results. Second question is, how much do they know? It's very important when you talk to someone to know what, what they know about you, how much they know about you. So it's very wise also to assume they know less than you think and start from there. So you can always, always over-deliver. And the third question is, what engages them? So today we live in a world of many channels, many technologies. Uh, there's live streaming, there's video recording, um, there's a presentation, there's TV, there's radio, there's social media, there's all sort of things. What type of content should I create to tell my story? 
if I'm the sage and I'm talking to academia, maybe uh, white papers and journals and th stuff like that, but if I'm Coca-Cola, obviously video works very well for them. So you need to think of that element and you need to create your stories and tell your stories in the right format to your audience. So now you've figured who your audience is, that leaves a question of the stage. Where are you going to tell your story? And basically, again, two questions to answer here. Where is my audience? So after you've profiled your audience, you know the personas that you're talking to, you need to know where they exist, where they are, where they spend their time, and when do they spend that time? So the where and when of the audience are important here. Obviously for you on social media, you use a lot of um, listening tools to answer these two questions. Yeah. So that's, that's basically it. You know to know where the audience is and when they are most likely to engage with your content. And that's where you tell your story. For me today, uh, this is where I'm telling my story to the Doha Creators community. I find this one of the most convenient ways of me telling what I, what I think is a good story. And finally, what is the moral of the story? Why do businesses tell stories? Well, obviously in life, in literature, you tell stories for many reasons. You want people to do something or not do it. You want them to uh, be aware of danger. Or There's so many w reasons why you tell stories in literature. But in business, you tell stories for one reason. That is to gain more audience. You want people, you want your audience to be not just aware, but engaged with your brand. So you want their attention. The competition today in business communication is all about the customer's attention. And this is what stories are very good at, attracting attention. Why will they give you attention? Obviously, that's a good question. It turned out, as we said before, stories work on two levels, the logic and the emotion. So people will join your brand for two reasons. They either trust or love you, or both. So I came here today, put myself in this awkward position. My heartbeat is up the roof, but I did it with the hope that I would be able to create some sort of a trust between you and I, and maybe, maybe, possibly, some of you will actually like me. Next time you think of storytelling, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. Every time you tell a story, you're aiming for trust and love of your audience. And that was my presentation. So I forgot how small the screen here, but. The, this, is, this is something that I have on the wall in, in our office. And this is a, a Native American proverb. I'm not going to butcher it, but it says something like, tell me the fact and I will learn, tell me the truth and I will remember, or vice versa, something like that. But tell me a, a story and it will live in my heart forever. Yeah, so thank you very much. Aziz Luxa, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I learned quite a bit today, actually. Am I the only one in the audience who was thinking, hmm, what archetype am I in my own story? Yeah? Most of you think they're the hero, too? No? Nah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aziz. Thank you. Okay, before we let him go off stage, I know that some of you definitely have questions. I certainly had a lot of questions while he was talking. So uh, we have a second mic that somebody's going to grab. And for whoever of you who have questions, Raise your hands. Uh, we'll choose someone at random, and feel free to shoot at Aziz. So who's got questions? Wow, guys, don't rush all at once. OK, we got one right here. Can we get him a microphone? Right here. Well, we're bilingual, so go for it. I'll translate. Quick translation, he just wants to know where, uh, what Aziz's background is and what kind of company does he work for? Um, English, so I'll show you the yeah. translation. Yeah. And I'll yeah. that. Um, my background is in public relations. For the last 11 years, I've been in Doha working for different agencies. Um, this is what got me into this idea of storytelling. I started to see the limitations in what I do. Basically, public relation is all about earning media for your clients or for your brand. And I thought there's a little bit more that we can do, but um, that wasn't very uh, popular, let's say, in the places that I worked for. Um, so I quit about two years ago, fired, according to some stories, doesn't matter. <laughs> it was a vague situation. <laughs> 
And um, I, I, I have people who know this story in the room, so I don't want to sound like lying. And I started Converse. And Converse is a content marketing agency. We try to introduce the idea of storytelling for business, uh, but I don't want to say much more. I'm, I'm not here to promote my company, so that's it. And, and I actually go by the title Chief Storyteller. Which we love you for. Does that answer your question? Excellent. More questions. Come on, guys. Rare opportunity. OK, we got one in the back, and we got one over here. So can we get to the gentleman? I saw him first. Blue suit all the way at the back of the room. Is it not blue? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. It was uh, very informative, and a lot of things really I really agree with from the very beginning. One thing I wanted to ask is, let's say it's a new industry, you're developing a new brand for your company, and you really want to focus on developing that story. And what are the kind of steps that one should really think about or go through in order to kind of start developing it or reach that kind of stage where your brand really, someone sees the brand and he understands what you're there, what you're trying to give, what you're, what you're standing for, uh, if, if that makes sense. It's, it's actually those five elements that we talked about. If you put in strategy, you will be basically looking at five different strategies. So the plot, what I call it, the plot will be your narrative strategy. That will be your content strategy. That will be your key messages. Call it whatever you want. There's a, so many. This is, this is the interesting part of, about the communication industry. Everybody calls it different names, but it's all the same thing. Yeah? So that will be the first thing. You figure out what that core narrative is, which basically is answering the question, why do you exist? If, you, if your business doesn't have a reason to exist, if it doesn't solve a conflict, if it doesn't fulfill a need or a gap, then it won't be successful. So answer that first question of why. Why do I exist? Yeah. Then uh, you have to develop the, uh, basically, audience strategy. So that's your target audience segmentation, your persona creation, your whatever. And that becomes the second step. Third step will be developing the channel strategy. So basically, do I go on social media? And if I say yes, which social media outlets? Again, common uh, classic mistake, you go on everywhere. Just because it's free, you create all the channels you can think of in the world, and then you dis discover it's very costly, actually, to maintain all the channels. It takes a lot of time, a lot of uh, uh, content and all of that. And then, uh, basically, you need to set up some sort of monitoring process in, in place to understand what is the impact of the, the, of, of the, or, or the return on your uh, stories, and that's it. So you put those five small strategies, and that gives you a big uh, strategy. Uh, we'll be, I think, announcing a workshop later on where we will go through this process in details, and God help you if you attend it. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, we had, uh, I think we're going to take two more questions, this one and then one more after. I see you over there. You'll be next. Uh, everybody who gets the chance to ask a question, uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Introduce yourself Hi. and raise um, your voice a bit. My name is Natalia. I'm a jewelry designer. And you almost answered my question before. Um, my question was because you insisted on uh, where and when is important. So where and when should I tell my story? And you, you did emphasize social media and that we cannot handle it all. So if we want to start, which three would you choose? Or, or, or maybe less than three, I don't know. It, it's different. Would you recommend? It's different from one brand to another. I only have, I only, my, my business only exists on LinkedIn. Because I thought of it, I'm a B2B company. I need to get in touch with marketing managers, basically, of different businesses. So why will I go on Facebook, for example? Mm -hmm. Why will I need 7,000 or 8,000 or 20,000 followers, out of which probably 200 are my target audience? Mm -hmm. You need to answer that question based on your business. Who is your audience? Right. And then we try to find where they exist. Like, quickly, I can say jewelry design, extremely visual, uh, Instagram and Pinterest. And yeah. the last, really last. 
are there any monitoring tools other than just looking? There's, there's plenty of monitoring tools. Again, if you're talking about social media, there's plenty of, I'm, I'm not an expert on social media. Maybe somebody can answer that. But there's so many mon of mon monitoring tools options uh, available. Some are free and some are paid. Thank you, hope that answers. Uh, check out the Alexa index, which will tell you any website you go to, how many visits they get, where they rank in a, in a country or anything like that. That might give you an, an indicator. And gentleman with the impeccable hair over there. So you can go to microphone to him. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sabir, uh, Sabir Asaria. I'm uh, an engineer by day and astronomer, amateur astronomer by night. Uh, my question is... Do you want me to tell you what I am by night? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in your opinion, is uh, journalis journalism storytelling? And if oh, so, yes. where does the truth fall in over there? Journalism is definitely storytelling. Um, as a matter of fact, the number one recruiter of journalists today is not media, but it's communication industry. Because when it comes to telling a story, okay, I'll, I'll give you a very quick example. So I said my background is in PR, right, in public relations. I spent 11 years crafting my skills to write press releases. And I got good at it, relatively good. People paid me money for it, so that must be good. Then when I quit, um, I'm passionate about animals' rights. So I wanted to write a piece about uh, that topic in Doha. And I got in touch with an editor of an online magazine here in Doha, who's a friend, and I said, can I do this? And she said, yeah, sure, why not? I wrote what I thought is a brilliant you know, piece of journalism. And she said, can you stop writing press releases? I was like, well, no, that's not really what I started to do. But it turned out, when I looked at it again, I actually wrote a press release. I, I, I got so programmed to a certain structure that I couldn't cover the story from all angles. She worked with me and I wrote it again and again and again and still she didn't publish it. It was crap, basically. But I learned the lesson. So yes, journalists are the best storytellers, in my opinion, after me. <laughs> it's true. Thank you so much. I think uh, that's all we'll have for now for questions. Aziz, thank you again.